Welcome to Conservation Conversations with me, Sarah Mohan. Today we'll be speaking with Dr. Ulas Karant of the Wildlife Conservation Society and we'll be talking about the problems of coexistence between people and wildlife. Dr. Karant, if you look at tribal people that live in the Amazon or in the heart of equatorial Africa uh, or even in our own Bastar district, they seem to be living in harmony with nature. And yet there are many conservationists who prefer the guns and guards model of wildlife protection rather than leaving it to the local people who would perhaps do a better job. Uh, what's your take on that? I think that's uh, simplifying the question far too much. There are very small communities, a very small number of people in heart of Amazonia, in the Kalahari, who live at extremely low densities, living off the land like they have done for thousands of years. But it's a very, very small fraction of the human population that exists in forests or natural landscapes at those densities now. Buster is certainly not comparable. So, in most other places, now densities of people living in forests are a hundred times more than what they were traditionally. And secondly, their consumption patterns, their demands uh, from the forest have grown enormously. So it's numbers, changing cultural patterns, changing consumption patterns. That is the problem. That's why you cannot have people living at densities of 100 people per square kilometers or 50 people per square kilometers in protected areas. So you've traveled all over the world and seen various models of conservation. Um, surely somewhere in the world you've come across uh, conservation that's done by the community and they've actually got it right? There are places where people are using resources uh, in a sustainable manner, uh, provided uh, it's not linked to big markets. Conservation in the sense of large animals, uh, livestock raising, and agriculture coexisting, I have not seen where it's without conflict and all peaceful. I, I don't think those examples exist anywhere. In India, you've been a staunch advocate of relocating people from inside protected areas. Uh, you seem to be of the opinion, you're convinced that nature and people can't coexist. Um, is that the case? Nature and people can coexist. It depends on at what scale you're looking at the problem. People and wildlife can coexist in India, they can coexist in Karnataka state, they can coexist in a uh, district. But when it comes to 3 or 4 percent of the land where large dangerous animals have to live at high densities, such coexistence becomes an impractical proposition and huge costs are imposed both on the people trying to coexist with large dangerous animals and on the animal communities themselves because of human actions. So it is the scale at which you look at the problem. There are several examples of uh, people, you know, who've suffered because of relocation. Now in these, in such cases, is it because of the concept of relocation itself or is it just poor execution that didn't make them work? People have suffered from relocation not just for protected areas. They have suffered far more from dams, mines. Whenever people are moved in an undemocratic, forced manner, uh, people have suffered. And this is not unique to conservation relocations. This is far more for actually uh, relocations related to agricultural dams, which, which have been the single biggest reason for displacement of people. That doesn't mean you don't need dams or you don't need uh, uh, those relocation. What it means is it has to be done better, done well. Can you give us examples of how uh, protected areas have improved after people have been relocated out of them? If you look at the original nine project tiger reserves in the 70s, Kana, uh, then Ranthambore, all of them, Bandipur, there was relocation. The parks come back. There is no doubt about the resurgence. The question is, are we doing the relocation right? Are we being fair to people? Are we being equitable to people? Are we giving them a better life than they had before? To me, that's the test case. And those examples are uh, harder to find. But over time, that has improved. Today, we have examples like Vadra, where people have prospered beyond their belief if you go and talk to them. And the same thing is happening in Madhya Pradesh. Many places, actually relocation is really working well. Initial relocation worked for wildlife, 
but didn't always work for people, the early efforts. But over time, pressure from NGOs, pressure from people who care uh, for nature as well as people has now steered it in the right direction. And uh, in places like Kudremukh, people are coming out and again prospering because the uh, compensation they get, the alternatives they get are so far superior. To me, that's the trick. In BRT, uh, in Karnataka, the Soligas seem to have, uh, you know, they've been living in and around the forest area and have been extracting products as well. And the wildlife seems to be doing fairly okay. So what, how, is something working there that's different? I don't see there is anything different uh, in this particular park, Biligiri Temple Sanctuary, Nagarhole, Bandipur. They were all in pretty trashed condition in the 1960s. After that, strong law enforcement came in. In all three places, logging was stopped in the 70s and very strong anti-hunting um, mechanisms were put in place. And this curbed the hunting by outsiders as well as by the local communities. So the resurgence of wildlife happened because hunting was stopped rather than from any of these other, other people saving them or local people saving them or anything. In the other places, NTFP collection was also phased out over time, the non-timber forest product collection. In BRT, it continued and it has been turned into a marketable commodity. What the consequence of exploiting these variety of forest products from lichens to various fruits and barks of trees in the long run for the structure of the forest, we don't know. Some indications, some studies seem to show that it's, uh, it's causing changes. These changes may not affect large mammals first, they may affect other birds, other communities of uh, creatures that depend on these resources. We don't know the consequences. All I am saying is there is a huge market for these products, for medicines, for cosmetics, for uh, cooking and there is no way three or four percent of the land that's under protected areas can meet this market. If you want to satisfy that market, you have to farm these resources outside. I don't think this dependency is good. And at the moment, there might be three to four thousand families uh, in, in that area. But with human numbers growing, how are you going to deal with it if it becomes four times, five times that number? Are they still going to live off non-timber forest products? I don't think it's a sustainable solution at all. But then, sir, completely preventing them from collecting non-timber forest produce seems a little unfair because how else are they supposed to make their living? And surely they're not going to overexploit their own resources. This has been the problem of human beings everywhere. We have always mined and overexploited our resources, and that's why civilizations have collapsed. So it's a part of human history. If you want human beings to live at very high densities, give them access to electricity, hospitals, good medical care, schools, which is what everybody wants. Nobody is saying we don't want these and we'll live like we lived a thousand years ago. So once you want these things, it can't be done inside protected areas and you can't expect protected areas to survive all this fragmentation and assault. If you say, okay, I don't care, we don't want this protected area, we want all these amenities delivered, then you have the example outside in the 96% of the landscape where people have been given these things and nature has gradually vanished. Right, so are you saying that there is no viable alternative to the guns and guards model of protection of India's wildlife? I'm not saying guns and guard model is the only model. In every society, there's a criminal element and some of the resources inside like tiger bones, ivory, some of the sandalwood, these are extremely expensive resources. They have huge markets and there are big mafias. Today, wildlife crime is as big as drugs. So when all these pressures are there, to say you don't need guns and guards and you can just do some slideshows and people will save wildlife, I think it's very unrealistic. But it does not mean you need only guns and guards. What it means is that to keep out the criminals, you need the guns and guards. But for the rest of the society, we need to have development balanced with conservation in a rational way. So people's aspirations are met without destroying nature. Right. Thank you so much, sir.